Welcome to Financial Planet Explained. I'm your host, Mike Menninger, Certified Financial Planner, owner and founder of Menninger & Associates Financial Planning. I'm here today with two of my associates. Uh, to my furthest left is Ryan Keefe, and immediately to my left is Andres Maldonado. God, I can't even say your name. <laughs> How bad is that? Um, anyway, uh, we're going to stray a little bit from uh, specific financial planning topics today, and we're going to talk about cybersecurity. What prompted this was recently there was a Department of Justice letter that was sent out to a bunch of clients who um, we think that it's associated with Medicare because apparently uh, a bunch of people, 384,000 people or 584,000, you remember what that was? Uh, 344,000. That's close enough. Yeah. All right, 300, basically a whole lot of people <laughs> were, um, um, were compromised and they received letters from the Department of Justice, which really raised um, awareness. And we also were just um, recently received some type of notification or letter, if that's the right word, instructions on cybersecurity from someone who's with the FBI for over 20 years. So we figured, hey, you know what? This is a great opportunity to talk about it. Now, I know I may look about the same age as these guys, all right? But these guys are just a little bit younger and they're a lot more on top of the technology aspect. Therefore, I'm gonna hand it mostly to them and I'll just throw some of my experience of things that have happened to me or things that I've observed with clients over the course of my career and lifetime. So you guys want to kick it off. That's great. Sure. I'll just do one. Yeah, I'll kick it off first. Uh, the first thing, and I think the biggest thing that I've noticed with uh, not only clients, personal experience and people that I've dealt with is that prevention is the name of the game when it comes to protecting your security and not only online, but uh, in your physical items as well. And specifically your personal, personable, identifiable information. Um, but along the lines, preparing for disaster is where you can do a lot of the damage in terms of protecting your security. Yeah, and there's a there's a few things that, you know, a lot of people hear and it's like, don't leave your password on a sticky note on <laughs> yeah, right. to your laptop. <laughs> or send it to um, somebody uh, through email. Hey, <laughs> this is my password. <laughs> but you wanna have some a more secure password, you know. So uh, one of the things that this FBI agent references is using things like passphrases, right. special mm -hmm. characters. Um, you know, a lot of times the I, or the iPhones now have, um, you know, the facial ID, but they also have uh, strong passwords so that, you know, you don't have to remember it. It'll just randomly generate a series yeah. of characters and letters that would almost be impossible for somebody yeah. to. Well, yes. yeah. And, and by the way, it also happens to be impossible for you to remember it because it's all kinds of mixture of numbers, letters, caps, <laughs> not caps. But that's where the past phrases come into play. It could right. be gunner, fakes. Yeah. Yeah. attempt or something, <laughs> I, you know, but you know, and then you throw in uh, some combination of special characters as well as caps, numbers, mm -hmm. small case letters, yeah. but you know, three unrelated words or related, but yeah. past phrases are easier to remember, but yeah. also equally difficult to identify. And don't, and don't use things like your birthday or your home address, mm -hmm. things, things that are very easy for a hacker to guess. Specifically because that information is typically on your social media pages. If you have Instagram right. or LinkedIn, especially if those accounts are public, you're pretty much giving them the security question answers <laughs> without having to talk to them. Yeah. So, uh, and even with that said, it goes along with the fact that those phrases and, and the things that you say, uh, they shouldn't be the same across all sites. Um, typically speaking, if you're just adding a letter or something across all sites to the password, uh, you're not really doing much good to the security of your of your account. And a lot, oftentimes, these phrases should be unrelated to other accounts that you have. At least that's the goal. Well, and to your point about using the same password, when you use the same password for every single one of your um, um, financial websites or whatever the case may be, what happens is if they somehow get the one, they got them all. So that's why it's good to have a mixture between the different ones. Yeah, 100%. Um, absolutely. And, you know, in the name of prevention, uh, one of the other things that he mentions is take good care of your sensitive data. You get financial statements in the mail, shred them. Yes. Yeah. Use the cross cut, use the crinkle cut method uh, or the shredders. Don't just, you know, rip them up by hand and throw mm -hmm. them in the garbage. There can be people that tape those together and easily yeah. figure out your right. sensitive information. Or one, going one further, people who are, if you're sending mail out from your home, mm -hmm. and let's say it's to the IRS to file taxes, local, whatever it may be, and they have outgoing mail in their mailbox, and people can just 
grab that. So oftentimes you're better off, at least with important information, going directly to the post office yeah. and actually dropping it off. And not even in the post office box because we've had two events occur within our local area. I don't know if you guys heard this. One of them, literally, the, the blue box outside the post office. People get into those, take it, and they did it right around tax time because why? There's going to be a boatload of checks in there. Social security numbers. Well, everything. it's not only that. You, you get that too. But what happens is that, um, and a banker gave us a presentation on this once, that they, I think it's called whitewashing. Mm -hmm. They can literally take a check and remove what's written on it stick their name on it and therefore all of a sudden now this check that was supposed to go to the IRS or whatever the case may be suddenly is now mine yay <laughs> <laughs> yeah and there's and there's a few other things that you can do from there's a ton of things you can do yeah. from a prevention standpoint one of the main things that this guy talks about is go online and create a social security account um, one of the things that hackers can do is they go online and they can pose as you on your social on uh Social Security's website, and therefore they can collect your benefits and create a whole lot of hassle for you when you mm -hmm. go to collect your benefits, even if you're not of Social Security age. But just by creating an account, you've locked that account in as your own. Um, it sounds simple, but it can save a lot of headaches down the road. And you find out later, once it's your turn to uh, begin to collect benefits, and say, hey, you've been collecting benefits for three years already. What's <laughs> up? Yeah, yeah, as if that, that won't be a problem. Yeah, right. <laughs> it would only be good if you were actually going through the benefits. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, and there's and the other big thing that you can do is place a uh, what's called a credit freeze on your account. Mm -hmm. um, there's the four credit reporting agencies. There used to be three, uh, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. Now there's Innovis, um, which I had not heard of until this presentation. Um, but what you can do is you can place a credit freeze on all of your uh, accounts, thereby making it difficult for anyone, including yourself, to open up new accounts in your name. Basically, you're notified if, if someone ever tries to open an account and you have a credit freeze, they notify you. Well, so the, that's actually a fraud alert. They'll mm -hmm. notify you. The okay. credit freeze... You it means can, nobody can open no nobody, it yeah. except you because you have to have basically the password and everything else to yeah, unlock You have it. to essentially go in and unfreeze everything right. to then to open do it, that. and then you can refreeze yeah. it, yeah. Um, things like that. By the way, been there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to add a little? A little? <laughs> it, was, it was after the identity theft, but we'll talk about it when yeah. we talk about identity yeah. theft. Yeah. Yeah. Was, uh, one last thing is it kind of goes hand in hand with... Um, you know, freezing your, your credit, but it, go, it goes with credit monitoring. Uh, oftentimes when you have these big data breaches, they say, hey, you know, get free credit monitoring for three years, two years, whatever the case may be. And, and that's great, but you have to understand that that's very much the, the check engine in, on your car. It tells you that something has gone wrong. It doesn't inherently prevent it. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's more of a warning sign that, hey, you, there's something going on underneath the hood that you should check out. Um, so when you see those, don't sign up for it and then just think, perfect, I'm done. <laughs> the long and short of it is you really need to protect your social security number. And, you know, there's a lot of different fraudulent types of activities out there, whether it be email, uh, phone calls, or what have you. One thing to note is that the IRS never calls, okay? Um, the only way the IRS will ever contact you, it's not by email and it's not by phone. They will only send you a letter. Uh, I was messing with some people that were calling me and I think they were on to me like on their third try calling me. I put them on speakerphone because I was with a group of guys and when we were all starting to laugh, I think they caught on to the fact that I caught on to them. But, you know, that's one thing to know. IRS will only reach out to you via mail. And when they mail, they don't put your social security number down there. So one thing to always remember. And I believe social security won't really call you either unless you have a scheduled appointment. Correct. Is that correct? Right, that's correct. And that's to confirm the appointment. Yeah, confirm. Unless, or, or yeah, that's right. If you have an appointment and it's already arranged to call. Right, yeah, right. that's correct. Call. Yeah. That's correct. And another thing that this uh, Mr. Lanza points out, uh, one of the big ones is wire transfer fraud. Um, and a lot of times it happens when uh, you go to buy your first home or, or any home really. Um, and these hackers get into an email that looks like the, mm. the lending company or the closing company and they'll send you an email, hey, last minute changes to the wiring instructions. Um, you know, we need you to reroute the money as soon as possible or you might lose your house. Right, and they well, time it perfectly because of the fact that they know that you're closing, call it next Thursday. They're gonna do this about 
four to six business days in advance oh, because yeah. that's the time when you're about ready to be wiring money and moving money. Yeah. They know that. Yeah. And so therefore they reach out to you at the precise timing that it makes you as the consumer feel like it's legit. Right. Mm -hmm. And in today's housing market where you may have missed out on three, four, five homes already, you're probably itching to not lose this home. Yeah, right. And a lot of people will just say, I, you know, I got to get this done now. I can't lose this home. And that's when they get it. And unfortunately, it happens all the time. Yeah, it's when emotions win. Yep. Yeah, yeah that's that's the thing he that he mentions. It says, you know, use caution. You know, don't red face test it. <laughs> you know, if an email looks legit, call and confirm. Uh, you know, it never hurts to be a little extra secure. Um, you know, because a lot of times these hackers will send links through email or they'll have pop-ups that pop up and they'll want you to click on it. Um, and it's just like a quick, like split second thing. Like, ah, I want that pop-up to go away, but that could expose you to. Well, you know, we run into it as well. Um, in fact, we had a situation not too long ago. You know, if someone sends us an email, hey, say, please send money. You know, we always want to confirm with the client in advance. Do you remember the one that came in mm -hmm. and said, hey, my uncle is the president of a third world nation and was kidnapped yep. and please send a hundred thousand dollars to this different bank account <laughs> that was red flags everywhere called her up it was legit, legit yeah. I, I, I was shocked actually it wasn't kidnapped it was the it, it was amazing but, yeah. i couldn't believe that it, it was like all the things that are red flags were red flags right. but it was legit right. but the long and short of it is that we'll never send money without actually confirming with the client and any financial institution should be the same way they should not be responding to anything and and if someone calls you know that's where we have to know the client mm -hmm. and we'll know whether or not by voice we can ask them questions you know what's the name of your dog or just common things that we know they're you know we just know them mm -hmm. and you know typically we get people who every quarter send us four thousand dollars well, we know that's coming, and right. they call up, we're good to go. Right. So, and what's what's scary is now now with the uh, you know up and coming of the rise of AI. Um, you know, my uncle had a story where uh, I was visiting him for Easter dinner, and he was telling me he got a call from his daughter, uh, my cousin, who was in prison and needed bail money, and he's like, "Okay, I'll, I'll figure out the wiring and I'll, I'll get it taken care of." Hangs up the phone. And he thinks to himself, "This this seems awfully strange." So he calls up uh, her fiance and says, hey, where, do you know where uh, your cousin is, or my cousin is? And uh, long story short, she was in the living room with him. It was a <laughs> completely AI generated yep. uh, voice, but it sounded almost just like her. And, yep, and that's, and so, and I've heard this story a handful of times. In fact, there's people testifying to Congress. AI is a big concern when it comes to this type of fraudulent activity. And simple things that you can do is just ask them questions that only that person would know. And typically what will happen is that they'll either try to beat around the bush or and not answer the question or they'll just hang up on you, which clearly identifies the fact that it was a fraudulent call. And it's just can't be careful enough. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so, a lot of, so what I've heard um, for people that are trying to combat that is they you know, have family discussions and they'll say, you know, if I ever call and I sound a little sketchy, like here are some good questions to ask me and they'll just have those or like a safe word kind of thing and Smart they'll just be able to have that at the top of their mind that way they're not scrambling if they think their loved ones getting locked up in prison or yeah. you know anything like that well it sort of happened to me they, they called my wife and said Mike's in prison she said good <laughs> don't leave him there you ain't getting anything out of me <laughs> and then you came home and she was disappointed yeah <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> All right, so now I guess we're gonna talk about identity theft, identity theft next. Right, mm -hmm. so, so these, those were kind of you know, more of a prevention talks, uh, but now we're looking at you know, what can you do if your identity is stolen? Um, first things first, identity theft is absolutely a crime. So you should call your local police station, file a report, and get that ball rolling. Um, you should also immediately go on to identitytheft.gov um, and that's where you can submit a claim and you know basically that gets the process started um, once that happens you'll want to notify all of the 
uh, credit agencies. Mm -hmm. They'll place freezes on all of your accounts. Um, and essentially, you know, you'll want to go in and start looking at all of your uh, credit reports to see what was fraudulently made. That way you can start disputing the claim with, you know, the, uh, the credit agency or the vendor, whoever, uh, mm -hmm. whoever it was. Um, so those, those are kind of the, the steps that you're going to want to take. Um, right, because what, what happens, and I'll tell you my story, because I had identity theft once before. But the, the concept of what identity theft can do is they can open bank accounts, financial accounts, establish loans, all that uh, stuff in your name that effectively creates money for the hacker. Right. Okay. And so one thing to point out is that they've stolen uh, tax ID numbers, your social security number, and file fraudulent tax returns. Right. And this happens a lot, and a lot of people don't even realize it until they file their tax return and the IRS rejects it because of the fact that that social security number had already been used. And, and I don't know the number, but it's staggering as to the millions and millions of dollars that are fraudulently stolen from the IRS mm -hmm. when the government could easily spend it wisely. But <laughs> aside from that, okay, it's a separate issue. Um, but there's a lot of things that they can do. So. What happened with me is that I think someone notified me that, you know, did you open this credit card? And it was a red flag. Basically, uh, somebody had gone down to Delaware, literally had a driver's license with my name and all my information on it. They closed out my existing Home Depot credit card that had like 30 or 40 bucks on it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, subsequently opened a new card and what the trigger was was they did four five hundred dollar gift cards which apparently aren't traceable which i don't understand why but apparently they're not traceable and the guy spent a little over six thousand dollars clearly he was redoing his bathroom because of shower materials and plumbing supplies and mm -hmm. tile and all that stuff mm -hmm. and so you know, I immediately contacted the police down in Dover, Delaware, but learned that what you're supposed to do is call the police in your hometown. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, this was probably 10 years ago. And basically then the, the police don't do anything about it, which, you know, if you don't enforce things, criminals are gonna do it more. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is I did all of the investigation on it mm -hmm. and because the cops didn't do anything on it. In fact, I can tell you that this person passed through at 6.02 p.m. through line two, okay, and where the guy got caught was about three weeks later, because all of this was, was alerted, mm -hmm. three weeks later went back to the same Home Depot, and this time it was like 5.15 in line four, and they identified that he had about $3,000 more stuff. They slide the card, sorry, he walks out the store. Nothing happened to him. Yeah. And you know, that's a shame. So, yeah. you know, so what ends up happening is the credit card company eats it. Right. You know, I wasn't eating it. Right, and, and unfortunately it's, you know, you go through all the hassle of doing the investigation. Oh my goodness. Yourself. Yeah. But, you know, unfortunately a lot of these crimes happen to the elderly. Um, and more, more often, more often, yes. more often yeah. than not, yeah. And, you know, it's absolutely a shame that that's what our society well it's what they prey on done, yeah. and there's a lot of things that try to protect yeah. those that are 65 and over right yeah i mean in my case my my mom uh she was looking for a job um things that happened things like that and she was contacted uh on linkedin which seems like a very reputable app software to, to get jobs get connected uh, by someone who said hey you know if you want this job position you're gonna need to provide me with X Y and Z social security and all this mm -hmm. stuff and in in the emotional turmoil she was going through at the time she said I need a job I got to get this done and she blindly just kind of put all the information there mm -hmm. and uh, you're right I mean it was my mom after reporting the police everyone knew but they didn't really do anything I mean she was right. put together the case the files the yep. paperwork um, and even to I me mean, to this day, uh, she's still recovering and it's been years. Yeah, you know, I, was, I, I would consider myself lucky in that regard because there are people who get identity theft and are, Thanks. right, exactly. Feeling it. Good time for a break. Um, it, we'll be back with you in just a few moments.
Do you keep up regularly with your investments? Where exactly are your hard-earned dollars going? Are you financially prepared for an emergency? I'm Mike Manager, founder of Manager & Associates Financial Planning. We believe that education and knowledge are powerful, and we want our clients to understand why we are making the recommendations that we make. It's your money, and you deserve to know where it's going, because it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. So call us today to discuss your financial concerns. Welcome back to Financial Planning Explained. Uh, Mike Manager, Certified Financial Planner. Um, we are continuing our discussion on cybersecurity. Uh, first segment went pretty quickly. Uh, we're not too far from ending the show, so let's continue on. Uh, we'll talk about some common scams. We, we did a little bit of that, and what we'd like to do is conclude and finish talking about, again, prevention, because prevention is the key. Mm -hmm. it, it's Because yeah, we've identified that even if you contact the authorities, nothing's really going to get yeah. done so right and you know, to, even to that point um well we'll talk more about the prevention piece but again sometimes i'm finding it just recently i was reviewing the business financials which i had passed off and delegated mm -hmm. to someone who wasn't really watching the shop mm -hmm. and what i found is multiple charges from organizations that i don't know yeah. so what i strongly encourage everyone to do is to every month when you get your credit card bills and when you get your bank statements, carefully review them item for item. I see it all the time. In fact, I went bowling in Arizona and I see this thing, three games, $231. I'm like, are you kidding me? What happened there? I call them up, they had no idea. So, so it happens more often than you think. And it may not be fraudulent, it could be mistaken, but at the end of the day, I don't want to be paying for stuff that I don't, I didn't legitimately You're buy. better off catching it early. Right, exactly. Right. And better if I, check. the one I couldn't do anything about because it was almost a stinking year ago. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So anyway. So so let's look at some cy uh, common cybersecurity crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, that way, you know, you can be kind of on the ready for them. Uh, the, the main one is, or I think the main one, uh, fake emails. You get them all the time. Uh, they might even look like they're coming from somebody you know, with like yeah. a slight typo in the uh, in the email. Address. Oh yeah, you see that a lot too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you just want to be careful when you read it. Does it sound like this person? Were you expecting an email? Um, don't. Uh, on that note, I didn't mean to interrupt, no. but on that note, and I've done this before. I've seen an email coming in from a relatively familiar name. Mm -hmm. When I hit reply, it's going somewhere else. Right. Yeah. Okay. And I believe they say that you can hover over the email address. Yeah. And if it shows something different. Yeah. So that's the hover to discover. Method, yeah. There you go. Uh, which is <laughs> what Mr. Lance talks about. Um, and it's actually funny that you mentioned that because I remember uh, just a few months ago, Andres and I got an email from you. Oh, yeah. Saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. hey, what time are you guys coming in this morning? And we both responded just seeing you know mike manager and then when we come in you're like what email are you talking about and we yeah. looked we hovered over it it was a completely fraudulent email and we had to you know do some you know prevention methods to hopefully it was somebody cool well if it was your name uh it had to be cool <laughs> <laughs> had to be cool if it had my name you cannot anyway separate um, issue so that's so that's those are some common mm -hmm. ones. Um, you know the attack on the DOJ or the attack the uh, the infiltration of the DOJ. Right. Yeah. Um, that was a ransomware where they go in and they they hack all of the data and they essentially say we're not letting you back into your system until you pay us a certain Correct. dollar amount. We you see a lot of times in hospitals because hospitals have all this information and people's lives are on the line and so you essentially hold hostages by attacking the, the database of the hospitals. And then all of a sudden you can't get um, information on, on, on patients, um, people's lives are at stake, so you have possible lawsuits for, um, you know, people will say malpractice, obviously you're being extorted for it, so there's, there's a Well, it's ransomware, and what they do is they charge a ransom to be able to unlock the data. Correct. And sometimes Correct. large corporations could say, hey, you know what, I'll pay a million dollars because losing that data for a day is not cost worth it. us tens of yeah. millions. Well, 100%. And what a lot of these organizations are doing is they're targeting these companies because they know they pay for insurance against ransomware. Yeah. And so they're saying, well, pay us $10 million because we know that's what your policy goes up to. Yeah. <laughs> Funny how that works. <laughs> Funny how that works. <laughs> yeah, um, and then um, one big one that we've been noticing, especially now that 
online shopping is is a new way of shopping. Um, you get a lot of fake messages from a UPS saying, hey, your package has arrived with a link in your text message. Uh, don't click on that link. I just yeah. got one of them too. Yes. Just, yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> you know what? I, I didn't order anything. <laughs> that's usually the first telltale sign. Um, but if it has a link, usually they never send the link. Um, I can't speak on behalf of all the companies, but nine out of 10 times, if they send you a link, you, you're wise not to click on it. The long and short of it is just be cautious. Uh, yeah. You know? So to, to conclude, so what are the things that people can do to prevent and it's a cyber attack or anything else like that? So uh, one of the things that we use here at, at Manager & Associates, uh, we use a thing called Keeper. Uh, Keeper is a passphrase manager or password manager. Um, so we have all of our passwords stored in this safe, um, you know, uh, can you explain a little bit more? Yeah, about so it? essentially it's a, it's a big is. database, but it encrypts all the passwords um, frontwards and backwards. Uh, and so essentially what you're doing is it's, you once you get to, um, let's say you, you break into the software and then you, if you were to try to pull it out, when you pull it out, that, that file isn't a downloadable file. So when you pull it out, you get this random code, um, which essentially isn't the password. It's the same thing with, um, uh, what's a protected files or protected PDFs. Mm -hmm. If you've ever, like with LPL, if you ever try to download uh, an LPL document outside of an LPL email, you won't be able to download it. It'll come up as a bunch of jargon. Um, so it's, uh, it's a way of preventing passwords, not only from the first breach, which would be the main password that protects everything, but if someone gets in, there's a, there's a, a fallout, a safety net, where those passwords are not encrypted. Yeah. And, this, and this helps for those people like me who have a thousand different passwords Correct. and you just want to store them in one place that's not a sticky note or a booklet that you hide under. <laughs> oh yeah, and there are people we know walk around with their book, their password book. Yeah. God forbid they ever yeah. lose that or, or yeah. whatever. My, when my grandmother died, she had a diary full of passwords. And it actually came in handy, so we need to get into a bunch of I know, No, it but, does. <laughs> but it's not, not advisable to do. <laughs> 100%. Well, and there's also a lot of securities out there, software. But Norton yeah. and uh, what other ones are there? There's like a few of them, uh, aren't there? Norton's the big one that I McAfee. Know McAfee. McAfee, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah there's multi-factor authentication that you can use where, you know, you enter in a password and then it sends a message to your phone or your email mm -hmm. and you have to log in through multiple sources. Uh, a little tedious and kind of annoying sometimes, but hey, worth it. less worth tedious worth than it. the and result. Yes. 100%. You know, less 100%. tedious than the result. So anyway, uh, guys, I appreciate you taking the time. So, you know, we can't underestimate or emphasize how important cybersecurity is and to maintain and protect your sensitive information. Even with what we do, we don't send any sensitive data to clients without encrypting it. Yeah. So, you know, we just encourage you to use some of the precautionary measures uh, that we discussed today. And, you know, it's a whole lot easier to prevent than have to deal with it if something happens to you. So thank you for tuning in today. We hope you have a wonderful day. And thank you for joining Manager and Associates with Financial Planning Explained. We'll see you next time. Thank you.